we'll be discussing the current affairs for the 16th of march uh, 2022 now the first topic that we'll be discussing and the topic that we'll be discussing in detail will be the social stock exchange the other topic that we'll be discussing in detail would be the fcr related curves apart from that most of the other topics are pretty static and uh, agri stack can be used in mains uh, for now there can't be any expected questions on it in the prelims also mobile data this is a very small topic and it is only from mains perspective why is the sto- social stock exchange in news the securities and exchange board of india has sought clarity from the ministry of home affairs on the participation of foreign firms in the proposed social stock exchange there is no clarity regarding if at all foreign firms uh, can take part in this social stock exchange or not the market regulator sebi has asked the ministry foreign entities can invest in social stock exchange listed entities now what is social stock exchange see a social enterprise let it be either for profit or not for profit not for profit what it does is it tries to invest more in developing the social indicators of the society like it improves the education of the society it improves the health of the society it tries to improve improve the environment over there tries to improve the transport over there it is a new concept in india and such an exchange is meant to serve private and non profit sector providers either private or non profit you know social enterprises by channeling greater capital to them this so- social stock exchange helps in these companies generating enough capital for their functions relevant securities of social enterprises will be listed on a dedicated exchange and they can be traded by the public it would be a new investment ba- avenue for socially conscious investors also investors who want to invest in such companies they do not need to randomly go and search for them because these companies are now listed on the social stock exchange and because they are listed on the social stock exchange it will also mean that they have to have annual reports that they'll have to file they'll have to have a corporate social uh, governance they have some responsibility towards their investors yes all of this now what is the importance of the social stock exchange India will need a significant amount of patient capital. Patient capital is capital which is not in a rush to move out. It can be there for a while to repair and rebuild the livelihoods affected by the coronavirus. Okay, and these uh, jobs and livelihoods are the bedrock of the economy. Now, conventional capital it prioritizes financial returns. It doesn't prioritize what will be the social benefit to the society. It will not be able to carry out such a burden all by itself. however social capital is not only patient but its goal is also to support and fortify the social structures that are in danger of collapsing because of covid-19 and this is the difference between conventional capital and social capital this will be the difference between a national stock exchange and a social stock exchange over here you will only have companies which are working for their own profits whereas over here you have companies which are working for the social benefits of the society and you also have people who are investing in these companies uh, who want better benefits for the society recently sebi had a technical group which was working on the social stock exchanges and that particular group had made certain recommendations based on the eligibility okay it said that both for profit and not for profit uh, organizations enterprises should be allowed into the social stock exchange provided they are able to demonstrate the social intent and impact behind their being over there corporate foundations political and religious organizations should be made ineligible because they are these are not directly related to any social uh, benefits for the society modes available for fundraising for non profit organizations you know the technical group suggests that they can raise money either through equity or zero coupon zero principal bond or development impact bond or social impact bond you know development impact bond social impact bond all these they work on the basis of some particular goal if the goal is achieved 
then they give a return of say some x percentage if the goal is not attained then there is no interest given rather the principal is just returned back and also donations by investors through mutual funds and in the case of for profit enterprises it will be through equity it will be through debt it will be through again development impact bonds and through social venture funds now what will be the fund size for the social stock exchange okay the capacity building fund which means the fund that will work on the capacity building of people who are working in the social stock exchange it will be about 100 crores and the fund will be under the nabad exchanges and other developmental agencies such as sidbi should be asked to contribute towards this particular fund okay now what are these uh, different jobs or groups which are under social enterprises or social uh, enterprises which can raise money through social stock exchange okay some of the functions are those uh, companies which are uh, working on eradicating hunger eradicating poverty malnutrition inequality those companies which promote gender equality by empowerment of women and lgbtqia communities training to promote rural sports and slum area development affordable housing all these organizations which are working on these fields you know all the organizations which are working on these particular fields are known as social enterprises and these organizations can de- therefore raise money through the uh, proposed social stock exchange now more details on the social stock exchange are awaited for now it is not all clear N- next topic hijab bro we had discussed about this hijab bro in uh, in the current affairs of the 7 uh, of this february on 17th now why is it in the news now the karnataka high court had passed an interim order earlier and now it has passed the final order now the karnataka high court upheld the ban on the wearing of the hijab by the students in schools and colleges in the state it held that wearing the hijab is not a religious essential practice in islam and is not protected under the right to freedom of religion guaranteed by 25 of the constitution please remember that under article 25 of the constitution which talks about freedom to practice profess and propagate religion only religious essential practices are protected now there is a doctrine of religious essential practices on the basis of which the supreme court decides what are religious essential practices and what are not religious essential practices the court said it was a reasonable restriction and that was constitutionally permissible the bench also upheld the legality of the karnataka government's february 5th order prescribing guidelines for uniforms in schools and colleges under the provisions of the karnataka education act 1983 in its 129 page judgment the bench also spoke about the possibility of some unhe- unseen hands behind the hijab row to engineer social unrest and harm- disharmony and express dismay over the issue being pro- blown out of proportion the court said that the school uniform will cease to be a uniform if hijab is also allowed this was the reasoning that the court has given the uniform will not be seen as a uniform anymore but rather uh, if different people can wear different set of clothing then it will uh, not be called a uniform anymore because uniform means that every person has to wear the same dressing uh, if you remember the background of this case that uh, the karnataka government had passed an order saying that hijab is not a part of the dress code on february 5th and after that in the udupi district there were widespread protests because uh, women were not allowed inside colleges and schools and in response to the hijab that was worn by muslim women even hindus uh, started wearing saffron shawls and this was the problem okay background on february 5th the karnataka government passed an order exercising its powers under section 133 clause 2 of the karnataka education act the directive specifies that a headscarf is not a part of the uniform 
and this woman was stopped from entering the campuses. The Karnataka High Court is hearing a number of petitions challenging the government order banning the hijab at the government educational institutions. As an interim order, the High Court held that students should not wear hijab or saffron shawls or use any religious flags while attending classes in Karnataka colleges which have a prescribed uniform. Till the court decides the case relating to ban on hijab in certain governmental colleges. Now, what are the problems involved over here? Okay, see, the constitution grants uh, the right to freedom of religion under Article 25. But at the same time, Article At the same time, this Article 25 has reasonable restrictions. It talks about uh, restrictions based on public order. It talks about restrictions based on morality. It also talks about health. So these are the reasonable restrictions which are present under it. Also, Article 19 Clause 1, as given over here, it talks about freedom of speech and expression. And hence, wearing a hijab is a proper expression which guarantees the right to freedom of speech and expression. Okay. Constitutionally, a right under Article 19 Clause A can only be limited on the reasonable restrictions mentioned in 19 Clause 2 and these include sovereignty of India, integrity of India, friendly relations with foreign states, public order, decency or morality or in relation to contempt of courts. Now, however, a student silently wearing a hijab or a scarf and attending class cannot be construed that it is a practice that is disturbing public order and hence banning of hijab actually it does not make a lot of sense under that particular context <laughs> while under the context of having this concept of uniform which is same for everyone it makes sense to ban it under the other idea of banning it under public order it doesn't make any sense to ban it okay also in India, we have the fundamental right to equality under Article 14. Okay, and other religious markers such as turbans worn by a Sikh are not prohibited. So why uh, does the government want to ban the hijab which is worn by, you know, certain Muslim uh, students? Now, that is a question that we have to ask again. Moving on. The Supreme Court states the telecast ban on Media One. The Supreme Court state the central government's decision to revoke the security clearance of Kerala-based news and current affairs TV channel Media One on the basis of intelligence inputs which are sensitive and secretive in nature. The Justice D. Y. Chandrachud, heading the three-judge three bench, said the center's decision had effectively shut down the business of the media house, which runs Media One, in the name of national security and public order without fully disclosing the specific reasons for revoking its security clearance. The Supreme Court said that the company was entitled to know the particulars of the ban. The bench said that the issue of whether the internal files of the government ought to be shared with the company to pursue its challenge against the ban would be expressly kept open to be resolved. Actually, what happened was, there was this media company called the Media One. And this company was actively following the CAA protests. And later on, it followed the Delhi protests. And hence... The center saw it as a uh, media firm which is going against its own interests. So the Home Ministry, the Ministry of Home Affairs had actually denied security clearance for this company. And because the Ministry of Home Affairs had declined the security clearance for this company, the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting suspended its license. Though this particular company was already in existence earlier for the last six years and then it only applied for a renewal of its license. Now also please remember that the grounds on which MHA uh, you know, denied the security clearance has not been made public, not made public to this company and the reason why it was not made public was said that it is in the uh, name of national security and public order that is the reason why we are revoking the security clearance and we are not going to make public the reasons which are there 
why we are not giving the security clearance we won't make it public why in the name of national security and public order so now it so happens that the company's license has been revoked hence its operations have been shut but the company does not know why its operations have been shut because it is protected under national security okay the information and broadcasting ministry had informed the malayalam language news channel media one that its broadcast license had been cancelled the cancellation order cited a home ministry order that denied any security clearance to the channel media one is operating since 2013 and the channel recently applied for a renewal of its license but the renewal was cancelled based on the home ministry's advice okay the channel was suspended for covering delhi riots okay so please uh, this can be used as a good example during your ss or it can be used during the main answers agri stack okay see what the agri stack is so as you know the government has this job of doubling the farmers income uh, according to niti ayog uh now because the farm laws were suspended the three farm laws were suspended the government has taken up this concept of agri stack in order to try and supplement farmers income now agri stack is nothing but it is a it is a grouping of data hence it is nothing but digital databases on top of which several such agricultural applications can be built like say for example several agricultural applications can be built uh, as it has been given over here different types of data are collected the personal details of the farmers profile of the land production details financial details of the people everything is collected and on the top of that using this data several apps are designed in order to make it easier for farmers to use it the government is working on a digital stack of agricultural data sets with its core as land records applications built over the stack will provide farmers with recommendations on which seeds to buy best practices to maximize their yield along with updates on weather agricultural credit insurance etc this will help increase the farmers income and improve efficiency of the agricultural sector so this proposal came in the place of the farm loss okay in order to double the farmers income by 2022 what is agri stack like what i said it is a collection of digital databases agri stack would have some core features including a unique farmer identity number it has a farmer id for each farmer and some building blocks such as data on weather data on science and research on agriculture and on agriculture agricultural prices in india and abroad information and access to government central schemes uh, the agricultural regulations and permissions so it will have all sorts of information now the aim of agri stack is to ensure that farmers take informed decisions on what crops to grow when to grow what seeds to buy and how to increase their yield players in the agricultural supply chain can precisely plan their production and logistics based on agri stack the overall objective is that india moves to precision farming rather than using uh, normal manual farming it has to use precision farming which uses lesser resources and uh, increases the productivity the use of all agricultural inputs in a specific measured quantity for high yields under the program each farmer of the country will get what is being called a farmer id id like what we spoke of or a farmers id linked to the land records to uniquely identify them india has more than 140 million operational farm households these new databases are being built primarily to tackle issues such as poor access to credit and wastage in the agricultural supply chain hence to improve logistics to increase credit to uh, help in precision farming for all of these reasons the government is taking up this agri stack now 
Also, it contains the details on weather and latest science and research for agriculture and uh, various commodity prices. Hence, on the basis of this, say for example, if at all a person develops an app which you know continuously gets updated on what is the commodity that the farmer is able to fetch maximum uh, money on, then farmers will shift to that particular commodity. Okay, I'm just giving an example. Anything can be possible. Now, what are the issues with an agri stack? Such an agri stack will use old and inaccurate land records. Okay, farmers' personal and financial details will be used without a strong data protection law. It might end up being an exercise where private data processing entities may know more about a farmer's land than the farmer himself. Without safeguards, private entities would be able to exploit farmers' data to whatever extent they wish to. Okay, now India does not have a data protection law yet. And without having a data protection law, if you know the government brings about this particular agri stack, which makes it easy to collect all sorts of data from farm sizes uh, to uh, the fertility of the soil uh, to the credit uh, to the credit uh, available for each farmer, you know all of this data if the agri stack is able to collect this data can be misused for any sort of a reason and the farmer will know more about uh, the farmer will know less about his own land as compared to some person who owns all of this data and also such a centralized stack will use old and inaccurate land records because for now we don't have updated land records we have older land records and hence it won't be very beneficial also rural areas have a low level of digital literacy Without having sufficient digital literacy, what is the point in bringing about so much data when the farmers cannot use this data? Okay, moving on. Reforms based and results linked revamp distribution sector scheme. The Rural Electrification Corporation and the Power Finance Corporation, which are the state-run lenders and which are the nodal agencies for uh, the revamp distribution sector scheme which was launched by the union ministry of power will release the first tranche of funds to a host of states so these are the no nodal entities for operationalizing the revamp distribution sector scheme now what is this scheme it is a 3.03 trillion rupee scheme where the center share will be about 97000 crores and it aims to improve the operational efficiencies and the financial sustainability of discoms okay now what are discoms like what i said we have earlier we had discussed this we have power generators and these power generators using transmission lines they transmit power and you have centralized uh, distributors so these distributed to various discoms okay now these centralized uh, distributors after giving power to these discoms these discoms are at a very local level say delhi has a discom delhi has discoms bombay has discoms and these discoms are responsible for passing on the power to various local areas within those cities it is i can say it is one of the last uh, connecting entities in the line for distributing power okay it is a reforms based and results linked scheme it seeks to improve the operational efficiencies and financial sustainability of all discoms power departments excluding the private sector discoms we don't have private sector discoms under this the scheme envisages the provision of conditional financial assistance to discoms for strengthening supply infrastructure the assistance will be based on meeting the pre qualifying criteria as well as upon the achievement of basic minimum benchmarks as uh, by the discom Okay, all the existing power sector reforms such as integrated power development scheme Deen Dayal Upadhyay Gram Jyoti Yojana Pradhan Mantri uh, Sahaj Bijli Hargar Yojana will be merged into this umbrella program. So this will be the umbrella program. What the revamped uh, distribution sector scheme will be the umbrella program and all these will be programs under this. Okay, And this program, it envisages financial assistance to discoms which are in trouble. Uh, for strengthening the supply of electricity. However, it shall not be provided to all discoms. It shall be provided on meeting some criteria and also on the basis of achievement of some goals. 
okay it shall be implemented on based on an action plan worked out for each state rather than one size fits all so different states will have different action plans and uh, it is the rural electrification corporation and the power finance corporation so which will be implementing it okay now what are the various components of this uh, revamp distribution scheme it shall have consumer meters and system meters the scheme involves a compulsory smart metering ecosystem across the distribution sector starting from electricity feeders to the consumer level including in about 250 million households it is proposed to install approximately 10 crore prepaid smart meters in the first phase itself okay uh not only will it have electricity feeders not only will it have a compulsory smart metering ecosystem it will also have prepaid smart meters okay next feeder segregation the scheme also focuses on funding for feeder segregation for the unsegregated feeders which will enable solarization under pm kusum scheme so feeders will be segregated based on thermal power usage and solar power usage okay solarization of feeders will lead to cheap free daytime power for irrigation and additional income for the farmers uh, if you segregate the feeders into solar based feeders then it will be useful for the farmers to generate their own you know uh, cheap power, solar power which can be used for irrigation and which will also serve as an additional income as farmers can sell back the additional solar power to the grid itself the scheme has a major focus on improving electricity supply for the farmers and for providing daytime electricity to them through solarization of agricultural feeders what are the objectives of the scheme the objectives are to reduce aggregate technical and commercial losses now these are technical losses you know technical losses is uh, anything technical in nature due to dissipation while commercial losses is losses due to lack of metering system theft etc okay to pan india levels of 12 to 15% currently it stretches to around 40% and hence the scheme uh, you know it aims at reducing these uh, losses to 12 to 15% reduction of cost revenue gap to zero by 2024 25 and the developing institutional capabilities for modern discoms revenue cost minus i mean the total cost for procuring the power minus the revenue generated it has to be zero at least by 2024 25 currently what happens is that this cost for procuring the electricity is much higher and the revenue generated is much lower and hence the difference is very high so the goal is to try and reduce it to zero fcra curbs okay please uh, see that these are the new changes as brought about by the amendment there was an fcra amendment in 2020 after this amendment these were the changes that were brought in the new the reason why it is in the news is because the ministry of home affairs told the lok sabha that united kingdom raised the issue of foreign contributions regulations act curbs against oxfam okay no what is the foreign foreigners contribution regulations act it is an act of parliament enacted in 1976 and amended in 2010 the objective is to regulate foreign donations and to ensure that such contributions do not affect internal security coverage it is applicable to all associations groups ngos which intend to release receive foreign donations all of the ngos groups and associations all of them who want to receive foreign donations they can receive it through fcra as this is the act which regulates them now registration under the act is mandatory for all such ngos Uh, receive any amount of money however this registration is only valid for 5 years the registration can be renewed subsequently if they comply with all the norms registered ngos can receive foreign contributions for five different purposes 
only for these five purposes can registered NGOs associations receive money. What are they? Social purposes, educational, religious purposes, economic purposes, cultural purposes. They need to have a separate account listing the donations received from foreigners and they need to get it audited by a chartered accountant and submit it to the home ministry every year. Only when this is followed will the registration be continued even after 5 years. Otherwise, these companies will get, you know, deregistered. However, certain people are banned from uh, getting money under uh, FCRA. Now, what are these, uh, who are these people? A candidate contesting an election can't get it. Cartoonists, editor, publishers of uh, registered newspapers can't get it. Judges can't get it. Government uh, employees can't get it. Members of the legislature, any party or parliament cannot get it. Okay, I told you recently that there has been a reg amendment in the FCRA. Now, according to the amendment, transfer of foreign contribution. Under the act, foreign contribution cannot be transferred to any other person unless such person is also registered for the same purpose. Or otherwise, what is happening is that NGOs which are registered, they are turning out to be shell companies. Which means that they are just getting funds and they are not properly using it. The amendment also forbids subgranting by NGOs to smaller NGOs who work at the grassroots. Okay, single FCRA account. The act states that foreign contributions must be received only in one account opened in the State Bank of India, New Delhi branch. No funds other than the foreign contributions should be received or deposited in this account. Only one account and that too in New Delhi. And any foreign contributions, they need to be deposited into this one account. And nothing apart from foreign contributions should be put into this account. Regulation. The Act also states that a person may accept foreign contributions if they have obtained a certificate of registration from the central government. Or they have taken prior permission from the government to accept foreign contributions. Only in these conditions can the particular... Uh, person accept foreign contributions while till now we spoke about NGOs the act states that a person may also accept foreign contributions if they have obtained a certificate of registration from the central government or they have taken prior permission the act also makes it compulsory for all trustees to register their Aadhaar card with the FCRA accounts reduction in the use of foreign contribution for administrative purpose Okay, that act decreases the funding that they have received through foreign funds to be used only for, uh, you know, purposes to solve issues and not for administrative purposes itself. Why? Because if you are using it for administrative purposes, then how is it going for, you know, social uh, benefits? It is not. Hence, it has reduced it from earlier 50% could be used for administration. Now, it has been reduced to 20% only. Also, Apart from this, you also have certain other provisions which are uh, giving over here. Like say for example, voluntary surrendering of FCRA certificate, which can be done to, which can be done by the non-profit agencies. Also, power to suspend FCRA reg registration of NGOs for more than 180 days vested in the central government. Uh, please go through this FCRA thing. Uh, okay. uh, there can be a question based on this. Now again, mobile data users in India touched 765 million. Actually, the mobile broadband users in India more than doubled to 765 million and 4G tra data traffic grew 6.5 times in the last 5 years according to a Nokia report. The 4G service contributed to 99% of the country's total data consumption and is expected to continue as a broadband growth engine for the next few years, even as 5G services are expected to be rolled out. So, most of the data that is being used under the mobile data is 4G data. And that accounts for around 99% of the data usage. And this report says that around 765 million people have you know, come to use mobile data. Please remember that 
the active internet users in india are only 400 million people and even after this uh, 400 million active who are active users the ones who use internet on a daily basis or a constant basis and even amongst this active users there is a huge digital divide which means that between men and women more number of men use it less number of women use it between rural and urban areas and then between elderly and uh, working age so there are several differences that exist okay the report said that millennials are now spending around 8 hours per day online which is a huge number millennials are people who are born after 1990s and they are spending more than 8 hours a day 